Good morning. We thank you all for joining us this morning as we gather together in the name of the Lord to worship our God and Father uh, as his church, as his people this morning. I want to invite you to stand with me as we begin our service with a, a call to worship from 1 Chronicles 16. Ascribe to the Lord, O clans of the people. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory that is due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the fields exult and everything in it. Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. Let's pray. Lord, as we gather this morning in your name, as we come before you now as your people in worship, we praise you today for who you are and what you've done, for your love and mercy. We thank you that you are a God who hears and answers our prayer. We thank you, Lord, for your ongoing care and provision. We thank you, Father, for this time that you have given us each week to come and join together with our brothers and sisters in Christ, to join our voices in praise and worship as we seek to do that in spirit and in truth. We thank you, Lord, today for your faithfulness, your love, your mercy in sending Jesus Christ into this world, your only son, to suffer and die in our place, to be raised three days later in victory over sin and death. Father, you are our rock. You are unchanging and sovereign. You've never failed us, never failed to fulfill your promises to us and to your people. And so, Lord, in this season of uncertainty, in this time of trial, you have been there with us, guiding and sustaining. And so we give you thanks and praise today, again, for who you are and what you've done for us in and through Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would guide and direct us now as we seek to worship you with a, a deep sense of reverence and awe. Lord, that you would use this time for your glory and for our good, we pray in Jesus' name. Please sing with us as we sing in Christ alone. Ground, his body. 
delay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, sin curse has lost its grip on me. with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my death. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever block me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever block me from his hand. I'll just pause for a moment uh, for those of you who'd like to follow along so you can find the passage, Psalm 68, verses 1 through 20. God shall arise, his enemies shall be scattered, and those who hate him shall flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so shall you drive them away. As wax melts before fire, so the wicked shall perish before God. But the righteous shall be glad. They shall exalt before God. They shall be jubilant with joy. Sing to God. Sing praises to his name. Lift up a song to him who rides through the deserts. His name is the Lord. Exalt before him. Father of the fatherless and protector of widows, is God in his holy habitation. God settles the solitary in a home. He leads out the prisoners to, pros to prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. O oh God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth quaked, the heavens poured down rain, before God, the one of Sinai, before God, the God of Israel, Rain in abundance, O God, you shed abroad. You restored your inheritance as it languished. Your flock found a dwelling in it. In your goodness, O God, you provided for the needy. The Lord gives the word. The women who announce the news are a great host. The kings of the armies, they flee, they flee. The women at home divide the spoil. Though you men lie among the sheepfolds, the wings of a dove covered with silver, its pinions with shimmering gold. When the Almighty scatters kings, there let snow fall on Zalman. O mountain of God, mountain of Bashan, O many-peaked mountain, mountain of Bashan, why do you look with hatred, O many-peaked mountain, at the mount that God desired for his abode? Yes where the Lord will dwell forever. The chariots of God are twice 10,000, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. Sinai is now in the sanctuary. You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord may dwell there. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up God is our salvation. Our God is a God of salvation, 
and to God the Lord belong deliverances from death. God's word. And now let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you are a great and awesome God. As we read in Revelation, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Father, we thank you for today, for your love and for your continued work among us. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your Son, who has redeemed us and brought us back into a relationship with you. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth. We thank you also for the many blessings we enjoy as a church family, for our unity, our spiritual growth, for our pastor, for the leaders you have put in place, and for all who attend and worship here. Heavenly Father, we pray for your continued work among us. Heavenly Father, while we strive to do our best in our daily walk, we are a sinful people by nature and live in ways which are not honoring to you. We ask for your forgiveness. Father, we thank you for each and every blessing we receive from you and for how you provide for us daily. We thank you also for the trials that we encounter in our daily walk as we know that you work them together to refine and mold us into the image of your Son. Give us the strength and faith we need to endure them. Father, we think of the ongoing pandemic and pray that you would continue to influence our leaders' decisions. May they make godly decisions and may your will be done. We thank you that in spite of the current stay-at-home order, the government has allowed churches to gather with a limit of 15% of building capacity. This allows us to have a service and live stream it for those who are unable to attend in person. We thank you. We pray for all of those in the community around us and ask that you'd make us a light to them, that they may come to know Christ as their personal savior. We pray also for the lost beyond our community, that they may come to know Christ as well. Father, we thank you for all of the missionaries that you've given us to support. Bless them and keep them safe, especially at this time, Lord, from the coronavirus. Father, we thank you for Pastor Lee. Speak powerfully through him this morning. We thank you for our elders and pray that you would give them wisdom as they lead us according to your perfect will. Bless and guide our deacons and all those who are active in ministry at FBC. Father, we lift up all of those who are facing a time of illness. Surround them with the love of family and friends, even while that is limited by the ongoing pandemic. And make them aware of your loving and constant presence as they face these trying times. Give their doctors and caregivers wisdom to correctly determine the cause of their illness and as they prescribe the appropriate treatments. And especially, Lord, we pray for healing according to your good and perfect will. We pray also for all those who are facing spiritual and emotional stress. We know that the isolation forced on us by this pandemic is taxing people in these areas. Be with each one. And finally, Father, we are so thankful for the ongoing financial support of our church family. Even when many are facing lower incomes due to the shutdown made necessary by this current pandemic. Bless each one for their continued faithfulness. We offer this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand and sing with us. How deep the Father's love for us how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch's treasure. How great the pain of 
searing loss. The Father turns His face away as wounds which mar the Chosen One bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulder. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was a Now, if you'll turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, we'll read verses 1 through 16, our New Testament reading for this morning. Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 1. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the, to the one hope that belongs to your call, one love, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he has also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended for far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. 
Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. God's word. Thank you, Dave. I'll ask you all to stand with me again as we come to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray together. Father, we are again grateful for the time that you have given us to gather in your name. We thank you for bringing us through another week. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and mercy in each of our lives and in the life of our church. We pray now, Holy Spirit, that you would come and anoint the preaching and the hearing of your word, that through it we may have new eyes to see. Grant us a feeling sense of the things that are here, a a weight of glory that lies ahead of us, a sense of urgency to the task to which you've called us to as a church body. Father, these days are difficult. Many are overwhelmed with anxiety and concern about the the future. And so, Father, we pray that this would be a time in which you would equip us and send us out into this world, into the community around us, with the hope and the love of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Once again, thank you for your patience, your faithfulness toward us, and pray again your blessing over us at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's be seated. Well, as a pastor, as you can imagine, I get asked a lot of different questions, many of which, between you and I, I don't know the answer to. Uh, In fact, these days, uh, it seems like uh, people have a a lot of questions, seem to be very interested in knowing about eschatology, which is to say they, they want to know and talk about how, what we're going through now, these current events in this pandemic that we're living through has to line up with what it says in the book of Revelation and other passages that have to do with the end times. Now, of course, there are all sorts of other topics and questions that people come to me with, but this morning, if I can, I want to turn the tables a little bit, as it were, and ask you folks the question. You ready? Here's the question. What is your eschatology? Which is to say, what do you believe about the church? How do you understand the church? How how do you think the church is to work? What do you think about it? Is it simply a place to go? or these days, to watch online once a week? Or does being part of a church mean something more to you? So that along with corporate worship, there is a a sense of community, a a place to belong, a, a group of believers to which we can have fellowship and community. Now I ask this because I really do believe that this ongoing crisis we are facing for more than a year now has forced many of us to wrestle with this question, to perhaps reevaluate what it means to be part of a church. And that is a very good thing for us to think about. In fact, asking these kinds of good questions is a very good way for you and I to grow in our understanding of things, especially when it comes to Scripture, when it comes to the Bible. We need to not only read what's there, but we need to wrestle with it. We need to ask questions as we read it about 
who it is that wrote this passage that I'm reading, why it was written, and of course, what it means. And so that's what I want us to do this morning. As we return to our study through the book of Ephesians in this chapter 4, the first part that Dave just read for us here, to look at it by asking questions in order, again, to better understand what it really means to be part of a church family according to what the Bible has to say, not what perhaps we think, but according to what Paul says here and what Scripture reveals to us. To begin with then, I invite you to open your Bibles to this passage and you'll notice that the first question that we are faced with here is this question of who. Who exactly is the church? And I want you to look at verses 11 and 12. What Paul says here, he says, Again, that after ascending back into heaven, Jesus has given the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. Why? To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. And so first and foremost... Paul wants to remind us, listen, that the church is the body of Christ. A lot of people these days seem to want to say, I I love Jesus, but I just can't love the church. I can't do church. To which I want to say, what did Jesus say when he confronted a man named Saul on the road to Damascus, a man who was busy persecuting the church. He said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? Christ so intimately identifies with the church that way. And so that after Easter, right, after suffering and dying for our sins and then being raised from the dead, Jesus, Paul says, ascends into heaven to be seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, giving us his spirit, and listen, gathering us as his people to be part of his body. Again, that is who we are. Which means then that as Christians, you and I need to think of ourselves as being both individual disciples, right, individual followers of Jesus Christ, and part of this body, part of this community of faith. You may be familiar with that very popular passage in 1 Corinthians 12 that talks about the body, where Paul puts it very simply, he says, You are the body of Christ and individually members of it. In fact, you'll notice, if you have your Bibles open to our passage here in Ephesians chapter 4, back in verses 3 and 6, Paul focuses very much on this idea of unity, doesn't he? That we, as the church, need to eagerly, right, eagerly maintain that unity, work hard at it. Because he says, we are one body with one baptism into one God. We have to be clear that this does not mean uniformity. Instead, in Christ, there is this diverse unity. We in the church are not all the same, nor should we be. I mean, I realize we can't all be as cool as the pastor. We we all come from from different backgrounds, from different experiences, and the Lord wants to bring those things together into one body. Each of us, right, being uniquely gifted by God. So that again, there is this picture of one body with many parts, one spirit with many gifts. 
furthermore, what we should see is that this church, the, the, the body of Christ as Paul calls it, is an absolutely essential part of God's plan of redemption. That God has a purpose for the church in bringing his gospel, his message of salvation to the world. So important to remember, in light of our culture's prevailing fascination with private spirituality, along with this ongoing crisis that seems to be pulling us apart, to see, to appreciate, how absolutely indispensable it is to be connected, to be committed to a local body of believers. And you'll notice here in verse 11, right, that along with gifting us each individually, Paul says that Christ has given the church, right, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers, or, or pastors, a couple of types of ministry mentioned here. The first is that of the apostles and prophets, right, who play this early foundational role in the church that the church is to be built on. Serving the church, right, that writing the scriptures as they were led and inspired by the Holy Spirit. You, you flip back a couple of chapters here in Ephesians, and I'll remind you, and you'll notice there, what Paul has to say about this. Ephesians 2, verse 19, where Paul again explains that you are no longer strangers and aliens. But notice, fellow citizens with the saints, you are now members of this household of God. Built on what? Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into this holy temple in the Lord. Again, we as the church, as members of the household of God, are built on this foundation, the foundation of the apostles and prophets, through the inspired writings of these men, God has laid this foundation for us as the church in his work. Which means, among other things, that this work has been finished. It's been completed. The foundation for the church has been laid. We, we cannot add anything more to it. We are to then simply build on it. Well, then Paul goes on to say, you'll notice here, that Christ has also given the church pastors, along with these prophets and apostles, that he's given the church pastors who are part of this ongoing building project, as it were. What exactly is their job? What, what do pastors do? What are they good for? Well, that's the question we need to ask. The next question of what? Along with who is the church, we need to ask, what is it that we are supposed to be doing? Verses 12 and 13. Christ has given the church pastors so that the pastors can do all the work of ministry. So that the pastors can be in control of everything to do all this important work of ministry and all you need to do is sit back and take it all in. No. Paul says that Jesus Christ has given the church pastors, notice, in order to equip you, the saints, for the work of ministry. Do you see that? For the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. My job as your pastor is to equip you. To be sure, the Spirit has gifted each of us uniquely, individually. But Christ has also given pastors to, to, to teach, to equip, to prepare the saints, the members of the body, the members of his church, to discover and use their gifts. 
in this work of ministry. I almost feel like saying, tag, you're it. One Bible scholar puts it this way. He says that the New Testament concept of a pastor is someone who helps, who encourages all of God's people to discover and develop and exercise their gifts. That is what I am here to do, to teach in such a way, to preach in such a way, to counsel and lead in such a way that you are better equipped to serve one another and to reach the community around us. So that's, that's what all of this equipping is for. It is for ministry. These sermons that I preach, the lessons that I teach, the one-on-one -on -one discipleship, the, the counseling is aimed at, again, equipping the saints for this work of ministry. The NIV puts it, to prepare God's people for works of service. As your pastor, I'm called again to equip and prepare you for ministry. And as members of his body, each of us, again, is to be equipped and called to different kinds of that ministry, which, which means then that, that being a member of a church family is about far more, far more than simply attending each week and supporting the church's ministry. Now, being part, being a member of a church is to be committed and engaged in the work of ministry, serving one another, using the time we've been given, the talents, the experiences, the comfort that we've received from the Lord in order to comfort others, to work at this work of ministry. One Bible commentator, again, named William Hendrickson, puts it this way. During, during the week, every member of a church should find him or, him or herself engaged in ministry, whether that's comforting the sick, teaching, evangelizing the neighborhood, hospitality, serving those in need, whatever the task may be that you have been uniquely gifted and equipped for. And listen, there, there are so many places to serve. So many brothers and sisters to, to minister to, to encourage. There are all sorts of opportunities to get involved in the life of a church family and in the community around us. But what we need to understand is that as your pastor, I am not the one to be doing it all. Instead, it is my job again to equip you, prepare you as members of the church to do that work of ministry. Now, I, I realize that for some, this may be a new way of thinking about the church. After all, some people look at pastors and say, well, they're in the work of ministry. With everyone else coming to church and supporting their work. But again, Paul is shifting that, is wanting us to see here that by grace, through faith in Christ, each and every one of us has been called to the work of ministry. And each one of us has been uniquely gifted by God been brought through various challenges and stories in our lives to serve God, to serve one another, to share, to be equipped for this work. And can you imagine, can you imagine what kind of church we would be if we saw ourselves this way? If someone were to ask, how many ministers do you have at that church? Individually gifted by God continually being taught and equipped for these different kinds of ministry. Someone once said, instead of monopolizing all of ministry, the pastor is to be then multiplying it. And you'll notice carefully the goal of all of this. You see here how Paul says that the, the purpose of all of this equipping and serving, that pastors are called to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Why? Why? Well, Paul explains why. Notice, for the building up of the body of Christ. Again, God 
has called pastors to equip his people for the work of ministry so that the body of Christ may be built up. Right? That, that is church growth. As members of this church, we are going to experience this kind of growth that Paul talks about here only when each of us lives out our calling this way to use our gifts and talents and time and experience to serve one another. So that in the end, church growth does not depend on having certain programs or offering a certain style of music or whatever it may be. Instead, real, lasting, biblical church growth is going to happen when each and every one of us works together as the body of Christ to reach the lost in the community, to serve and build one another up. What does this look like? What, what does building up the body of Christ look like? Right? If, if all of this gifting and equipping is focused on bodybuilding, if you were, on church growth, then how do you measure that? Because if we're being honest... We all have very different ideas of, of what a healthy church is to look like. What a successful ministry should look like. Well, again, for Paul, the church is to be a place in which God has gifted each member, provided pastors to equip them. It's a place in which we are called to build and grow together in faith. And so the emphasis, the metric, if you will, is spiritual maturity. Where do you get that? Look at verse 13. Paul says, The church has been given pastors, again, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, the building up of the body of Christ. Verse 13, Until we all attain to the unity of faith, the knowledge of Christ, to maturity, to the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. How does Paul measure? This building up, this growth that he talks about here, he measures it by unity of faith, knowledge of Christ, spiritual maturity, not the size of a church, not the style of its worship, not the programs that it offers. Instead, again, to grow in unity, to grow in knowledge, to grow in spiritual maturity. Which means we have a lot of work to do, don't we? But the point is that there needs to be growth. As members of his church, called to this work of ministry, gifted uniquely to share them with one another, different experiences, life stories into this group, united by one spirit with one goal in mind. To glorify God, to grow together. Right? It all starts with seeing ourselves this way as the body of Christ, individually members of that body, so that just as a physical body grows, in the life of a healthy church, there should be evidence of genuine growth and maturing in our faith. After all, that think about that. It should be a natural result, if it is true, that coming to faith in Christ is being born again. If you're born again, then after birth you, you grow. We, we know this as parents. As parents, if, if you've had a child, you can see you can measure their growth over time. To start to, to watch them walk and then talk, gradually develop an attitude, I, I've been telling people, even our daughter, Emma, Emma, who has uh, Down syndrome, certainly has cognitive uh, disabilities, limits. But I'm going to tell you, she turned 13, and she's right on track with her teenage attitude. Hmm. We need to track our development. We need to measure our growth. As individual Christians... As a church family, to be able to measure this growth over time because it is not enough to just go through the motions. 
We need to begin growing deeper in our faith, in our understanding, and our love for God and who he is and what he's done for us. Again, the problem is that many of us have stopped growing. They call this arrested development. Too many Christians are experiencing arrested development when it comes to their spiritual maturity. It's a very serious concern for Paul. In fact, he says the reason we need to be equipped to serve, the reason we need to be maturing in our faith is so that we would be able to stand firm, right, in times of uncertainty like this. That's the question, why? Paul has just explained who the church is, what the church is called to do, and now he explains why that work is so important. Verse 14. We need to be growing in our faith. Why? Notice. So that we may no longer be children who are tossed to and fro by these waves, who are carried about by every wind of doctrine and human cunning and these deceitful schemes. What are these waves? Well, waves of suffering. Waves of uncertainty, unrest in the world. Waves of stress and anxiety in our life. Life is filled with them. They come crashing down on us. And the question is, do we allow them to get to us? To toss us, Paul says, to and fro to make us question our faith, doubt our beliefs. I mean, it seems that that there are a lot of waves going on recently. And there is a real danger of allowing them to turn us upside down, as it were. And while I believe that the Lord is certainly at work in all of this, accomplishing a thousand good things through it, I also believe that our enemy is wanting to use this time of crisis to harm us, to cause us to doubt. I shared earlier this week an article on our church Facebook page that I'd encourage you to read that talks about this, to force us, to cause us, rather, to to lose trust in God, gradually sink deeper and deeper in our frustration and disappointment, to maybe disconnect us from our church family and separate us from fellowship, if you can. To simply weigh us down with this spirit of of grumbling and complaining. I don't know about you, but that's something I need to battle against. Again, maybe this season of testing is to see if our faith is in fact deep enough. If we are, as Paul says, mature enough to handle these waves that life is throwing at us. We know, right? We know that coming to faith in Christ is not the promise of smooth sailing. It is not the ticket to a problem-free life. There's going to be times of suffering, incredible heartache, times of stress and worry and loss. The question we ask ourselves here is, are we going to be ready? And this is what Paul is saying to us. That we should not be like children tossed to and fro by these waves. Our faith needs to be grounded in maturing and growing. Along with this, you'll notice that Paul says that this spiritual maturity in in the church is also marked by not being carried away. Not being blown about by every wind of doctrine and cunning and crafty, deceitful schemes. Do you see that? Sadly, as, as, as the church, we are constantly being confronted by these kinds of things, aren't we? These lies and twisting of the gospel that, that want to carry us away from the truth. They come in all sorts of forms. Paul talks about them as every wind of doctrine, this false teaching right within the the Christian community. 
certain church leaders, Christian authors posting things, writing things in books that seem to blur the lines, as it were, in very subtle ways. But the point is, if we are not spiritually mature, we are going to be in danger of being carried off by this. And so how, how do we guard against all of this? How do we guard against being tossed around and carried away? Verses 15 and 16. Paul says, instead, we are to speak the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into Christ, who is the head, from whom the whole body, notice, is joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, it will make the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is how we are to go about it. This is what the church is to look like. It is a church family in which you and I are committed to one another in such a way that we are willing to speak truth in love with one another. One of the marks of spiritual maturity, right? It's a very balanced one, isn't it? You think about that, to be able to speak truth in love. To see that happen within our church family, to be a a body of believers, a community of faith in which we gently, lovingly speak truth in love to one another. Not out of a position of condemnation or judgment, but out of a genuine love and concern with this goal of restoring, encouraging, and building one another up. That, that's a goal to strive for, isn't it? I like the way John Stott puts it when he said that truth becomes hard if it isn't softened by love, and love becomes soft if it isn't strengthened by truth. In other words, you can be someone who is so overly consumed with knowing and defending the truth and yet lack love, you'll come off as harsh and insensitive. You could be a person, on the other hand, who is so loving, concerned with others, that you become soft and lose sight of your direction and purpose. And so Paul says there's this balance of speaking truth in love. In fact, we should constantly be asking ourselves, how am I doing at this? Do I have a healthy balance in my life? Am I too harsh? Am I too soft? Paul points to a couple more characteristics here. Talks about spiritual maturity, but in the end, it is simply that, again, there there needs to be some evidence of growth. A spiritually mature church or Christian is someone who, who never stops growing. To be comfortable with where where things are at, to be complacent, is a very dangerous place to be. And again, I want to say too many of us have become that way. Satisfied with where we're at, spiritually speaking. And so Paul says, grow in every way. Ask yourselves, how how am I doing in humility? Where's my understanding at? How am I doing at showing love? Where's my patience Where's my forgiveness? To pray in and through this very difficult season, Lord, use it in my life to grow me in that area of contentment, in that area of anxiety, in that area of faith, to grow in every way, Paul says, and to never stop growing. And then Paul says in verse 16 that spiritual maturity means that that we are being equipped and working properly. You could be growing. Again, you could be maturing in your faith. That's great. You can even have that balanced approach between love and truth in your life. But if you are not, if you are not putting it into action, if you are not engaging in the work of ministry, What good is it? 
Again, a growing and maturing believer and church family is, is a people group who are not only equipped for ministry, but are actually doing ministry, serving one another. And so that is what Paul wants us to see in this passage. Brothers and sisters, it is by grace, through faith, in Jesus Christ that we are saved. And listen, a big part of that salvation means that you and I are now part of his body. Individually, members of it. So that being connected with a local church is not optional. But here's the thing, being part of that body, being part of a church means that you have in fact been called as saints and have been enlisted into this work of ministry. Let's close by reading these words from pastor and author J.T. English. He reminds us that God isn't interested in creating an audience. He wants participants. Paul insists that one of the main purposes of the church is to invite all people into this work of ministry, not reserve it for a select few. In the church, there isn't a group of people who do ministry and a separate group of people who receive it. All members of the family of God are called to do the work of ministry and all members of the church are called to receive that ministry from one another. We are one body with many members, and leaders are supposed to bridge that gap. Churches that want to create a culture of deep discipleship call on everybody to participate. They want to get all people, every member, involved in the mission of building up the body Lord, would you do this in our church? Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful for your patience with us. We thank you once again for your word this morning, for the vision that it gives us that you have given for the church as the body of Christ, equipped, maturing, and serving one another. We thank you, Father, for this local family, for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to see that you have brought us here to be part of this work of ministry so that we can build and encourage one another so that we, as the body of Christ, can reach the community around us. We pray, Lord, your blessing over us this week. And we thank you once again for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we finish off with us.
perfect, spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself, I cannot die, my soul is purchased by his blood, by living hid with Christ on high. With Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. One with himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. Christ my Savior and my God. And now our benediction. Ephesians chapter 3 verses 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever.